Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Meyer. I'm a developer advocate at Agalia. I am Brian Cardell. I am also a developer advocate at Agalia. And uh, yeah, we're your hosts for Agalia Chats. And um, we've been doing actually a, a number of uh, chats recently about browser engines and that sort of thing. We just, the, the most recent one before this episode was about uh, Ladybird, which is a novel browser engine. And the one before that was about Servo, which is a novel browser engine that uh, Agalia works on. And uh, after we did those, the, an idea that I've had kicking around in my head for a while about first person scrollers turned into a blog post um, where I was basically saying browser engines have these incredible like rendering frame rate performance constraints that we, I don't think we really think about and that it would be really awesome to talk to people who have experience with that sort of thing. And that's what we're going to do today by talking to uh, Ian Kilpatrick. Ian, thanks for being here. Thank, thank you very much, Eric. Um, hi, my name is Ingle Patrick. Um, I work on the Blink rendering engine uh, for Google. Um, I should say I'm here in my personal capacity. Um, uh, in a prior life, um, I was a web developer and then made the transition to become a browser engineer. Um, I didn't know C++ or anything like that when I did that, but now mm. I'm probably six or seven years in to working on rendering engines. Well, wow. So you... You actually just, you jumped into the other side of things without having like prior programming experience? Um, yeah, well, so I had a lot of like Java experience, JavaScript. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so, and, you know, I had, you know, some like embedded C, so it was, you know, C++ adjacent. Um, but, you know, as any C++ developer will tell you, uh, C++ has, you know, a lifetime's worth of quirks and <laughs> weirdness to wrap your head around mm. so it was a little bit in the deep end but you know pr programming languages are just a tool you can you know you can make that work um but i sort of you know wanted to work on browsers because as a web developer i was you know fed up with you know bugs and shortfalls that i felt on the platform mm. and th there are quite actually a lot of browser engineers who sort of went down that path wow that's re that's really interesting because i i've always it always seemed to me like the only way you could possibly get to work on a browser would be like you have to know C++ and you have to have like experience with coding, visual rendering or whatever. Yeah, it's sort of it's sort of interesting. The nice thing I was sort of allowed when I did this transition a lot of time to sort of ramp up um, on a new team. And you know, my experience with you know, front-end development really, really helped. But you know, there's obviously a lot um, that I didn't know. And I was also fortunate that there was like a lot of people who could sort of, you know, mentor me on the team, mm. which helped a lot. But there's like a, a surprising amount of like browser engineers who have gone through that path. It's not an easy, it's, it's not an easy one, um, obviously, um, but it is one that's possible. Um, you do, you are at an advantage coming from like a front end background because you understand, you know, the problem space and you know the the problems people are running into, you know, much easier than someone who's come from like a C++, you know, like say like a database background or something like that. Mm. So so you know you are it, it, there's there's pros and cons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. And so yeah, you said you've been there six or seven years. Did I get six that or right? seven years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, pr so primarily been focused on layout, um, and that's oh. sort of where I spend you know the, the vast majority of my time. So you know, uh, quite quite a few of, few of your listeners might know this, but you know, very very quickly, your know, rendering pipeline basically encompasses you know from uh, you know you've got your user line script, and then you know taking the HTML script, CSS, and producing pixels on the screen, um, and the rough phases in that is we have style, which, you know, calculates, you know, you say like in your CSS, background color, you know, red, for example, and we take all of the rules and we decide, oh, you know, this element should have a background color of red. Um, so that's, you know, style recalc. We then have layout, which is what I spend the majority of my time in. So we're taking those styles and then working out the geometries for all the things on the page. So we work out the position, the width and height of all the different elements, and we work out how the, to the text should flow on the page. We then hand that off to Paint. Um, mm -hmm. So Paint goes, great, you've given me all of this geometry information. 
I'm now actually going to, you know, you know, create a whole bunch of paint commands. So, you know, create this rectangle at this position with this background color, you know, this rectangle here to represent this border for something else. Um, and then that's handed over to the, it gets murky. This gets, you know, to the limits of my, my knowledge, mm -hmm. but to compositing and rasterization. So then, you know, rasterization is taking those paint commands and actually, you know, producing pixels in a buffer that can be displayed onto the screen. Um, so very, very elaborate pipeline. I primarily spend, you know, a lot of my time in layout. So think about, you know, like Flexbox, grid, table layout, block layout. That's, that's where I spend, you know, the majority of my time. Right. So all of those, like all those CSS commands, in effect, you're, you're working in the area where you, you, you have to figure out based on these commands, where should these rectangles be and, you know, how wide and how high and what's in the background and what's in the foreground. And are those basically separate rectangles? I'm just curious, like is the, is the background, like the box of the element, one draw command and then the text a different draw command that the compositor then puts together? Yeah, so they are, so there's a great, the the in joke is that how you paint is based on, you know, how you paint CSS is based on a um, appendix, not not even like, you know, proper what we think of like spec text. It's like an appendix of like one of the CSS um, specifications. Hmm. But there's a whole bunch of different phases in the paint phase. So roughly speaking, you'll say like paint your backgrounds and then paint all of your like foregrounds and then paint these types of elements that like have, you know, Z index that are positive and stuff. And so like there's a whole like set of tree walks you need to do um, to get the right layering of everything. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit, it's, it's complex like that will be, be like a whole like 20 minute detour um, if we wanted to go into that. <laughs> but from a layer point of view, we just produce like a few basic rectangles. Uh -huh. So layout works in like board, you know, border box um, coordinate system. Um, so we produce like one rectangle uh -huh. that represents, you know, the border box rect of the element. Uh -huh. There may be multiple if you've been fragmented, which is a complex topic. We produce a few other rectangles, like how much overflow you have um, if you're a scrollable area. And then we say like, hey, this is where the text is and here's how you should render the text and a few other things like that. Yeah. There's so much complexity in, in here. Um, there, there really is, yeah. <laughs> and if you were to write a browser the way that we originally wrote browsers, right? Like single thread. And you did just like the most naive implementation of this where every time anything changed in the DOM, you just tried to recompute the whole world. Mm -hmm. Like things would be, yeah, incre incredibly slow. Um, yeah, I don't think that a page would ever finish loading. Like yeah. as long as, like as long as the universe will last, the, it won't, <laughs> it won't ever finish loading. There's so many things that we do to keep um, the design of things performant or, or able to be made performant. And then yeah. there's, you know, even on the things that aren't specifically that, there's like constant efforts to make it faster, make it, you know, make it more performant because those are advantages. Right. I mean, yeah. I think that was uh, one of the things that was really nice that came out of the split of what kit and blink. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You wanted to make V8 and that launched this sort of like JavaScript engines performance war. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and it was really positive, the outcomes. I mean, it's just so much faster. And yeah, I mean, like all engines have like really great, you know, JavaScript engines now. Um, they're all, you know, have like multi tiered um, JITs. Um, yeah. And that like competition is fundamentally good. Um, it in improves everyone. Um, and I think like, you know, one of the things when like Blink forks from WebKit is that we said, yeah, we want to introduce, you know, more diversity into, you know, rendering engines. And um, I think that that it took a while um, because, you know, we did inherit like all the same behaviors as WebKit. Um, but I think we're at the place now where, you know, fundamentally Blink and WebKit are two completely different beasts, um, uh, which is, you know, a good thing for the web. 
Yeah, going back to your earlier point, yeah, like I so obviously, you know, I wasn't around, you know, when browsers were being written in the you know early late nineties type of thing. But I believe um, you know, the early browsers more or less worked how you you know you just said, in that, you know, when you resize, you know, the the browser window, uh, things you know, we basically recomputed layout, you know, from scratch for the whole thing and that blew away. Um, the entire state. You can roughly like simulate what you know that would that would feel like today. If you place, you know, if you grab the HTML element and then place like display none on it, and then you know do display initial, so display block block or whatever, that will like you know more or less wipe away the whole you know the whole style, all of the layout, all of the paint, and then you know force us to regenerate it. So you can get a sense of like how slow that would be for like any incremental step. Um, we do care about that like, you know, initial bootstrapping performance because, you know, fundamentally that's what like pages, you know, if you just visit a page, we have to do everything from scratch anyway. Um, but you're right, we spend like a lot of time making sure that incremental changes to the DOM, to the CSS or whatever um, is fast and we can do it, you know, in sub millisecond type time. Yeah, I remember uh, maybe in the mid 2000s uh, reading an article that somebody wrote on the inner workings of WebKit and the introduction of uh, like bloom filters and like how uh, selector matching works and why it's important to do that. Um, I was at the time writing a little library that was like did try to do the naive thing and sort of uh, match like jQuery would match with a tree walk for everything, right? Mm -hmm. If everything yep. takes a tree walk, like, wow, you're in big trouble. Yep. Yeah, so that's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. I've got like a working understanding of you don't want to have to recalc style for the entire tree. You want to try and find like the minimal set that you need to, you know, like invalidate on. Um, and so that's, you know, broadly speaking, what those bloom filters are used for. But yeah, like the, the rendering pipeline sort of has these caches and these tricks you know the, the rendering pipeline to you know make everything fast fundamentally is an elaborate set of caches you know at the style you know stage we have caches to go like hey we don't need to recoup you know, recalculate style for you know this element we know that it's not affected by you know this this dynamic change you've done to you know your css or html it's got a whole bunch of other caches as well to make sure that like you know we can create styles quickly and stuff like that so we broadly speaking have two classes of caches we have a cache for what we call the min max content sizes and a cache and a layout cache paint has a whole series of caches as well so when if we know that like uh element hasn't changed fundamentally layout wise like its geometry hasn't changed and its style hasn't changed, we can reuse all the paint commands we've generated. Then like the later stages have caches as well. So like to get anything you know, fast to make sure that we can do you know, these dynamic changes in sub millisecond type time. Um, yeah, the whole system is you know, invoking a cache pretty much at every single level and potentially multiple different caches. Hmm. So that, that's like, you know, how we've, you know, that's, you know, the only trick that we've got up our sleeve um, to make any of this, you know, remotely fast. Um, otherwise, you know, we'd be behaving like 90s era, you know, things. Um, and we sometimes do need to fall back to that. Um, we'll be like, you know, recomputing the whole world um, mm. the whole time. But yeah, the, the rendering pipeline, elaborate set of caches. That's that's all it fundamentally is. <laughs> right. And you're, you're trying to get all of this done in sub millisecond time because... Like what? What is the rendering speed, or sorry, what is the frame rate that browsers basically insist on? Yeah, I mean, so you know, th this sort of gets into you know what we're you know like optimizing for. Mm -hmm. It's it's really really difficult because you know fundamentally we have a very very broad spectrum of devices that we care about. So, you know, you take your, like, you know, high-end desktop machines, you know, you might have multiple CPU, you know, multiple cores, huge amounts of RAM, relatively big, you know, like, 
screens, for example, as well. So like your your buffers for the actual graphics that you need to draw on need to be quite large as well. Yeah, and also like you know, a good internet connection. And then all the way down at the low end, you've got these like Android devices, which might have like two cores, a gigabyte of RAM, an anemic L1, L2 cache, pretty pretty bad network and then also but like a lot of these low-end devices also have like relatively high density screens they need like a lot of gpu ram to actually like hold all the pixels in memory so you know basically our target is be as fast as possible but but we can't target hey we always try and be at like 60 60 you know tips um because like fundamentally like on you know on what device and what scenario um and there's like trade-offs that we have to make um, all the time. What, one thing that might be good to talk about is like performance is actually quite multifaceted in the sense that, um, you know, we, we think about performance as like how fast can something go. Um, so, you know, the traditional thing, you know, we think about is like to bring up a car analogy, like, oh, my car can do like zero to 60 in like four and a half seconds. And this other car can do like you know, zero to 60 in like four seconds. So car B is obviously like better. So that's sort of like, you know, raw, what I call like raw throughput performance, like how much work can you get done in some, some amount of time? And, but like, there's a whole bunch of different, whole bunch of different things that you can measure there. So like, you know, what's your raw throughput performance and like how fast you can do layout, how fast you can do like style recalc. Um, and so the benchmark, the like artificial benchmark here uh, is like motion mark, for example. Um, and that is really, really good at just measuring this like raw throughput performance. That sort of raw throughput performance is like complex because for what web developers are targeting, it's not necessarily a good, a good correspondence to what like web developers care about. So if you're a web developer working on like a website, you care, depending on what you're building, you might care on about raw throughput for performance if you're like animating something on a screen and whatnot. But a lot of the time you might just care about, you know, I've, my user has tapped on the button. How quickly can I like refresh the DOM and, you know, produce the frame so it doesn't feel chunky, for example, or how quickly can I, and, you mm. know. Then there's a class of performance, which is sort of like, there are perfor- lots of performance cliffs and this is what, like, I find at least developers most care about. What's a good example? A good example of this is, like, I use some feature and my site has gone from, like, you know, performing layout in, say, like, 50 milliseconds to, like, 500 milliseconds, um, uh, which happens. Oh. And that... Um, is what I find at least like most web developers get most angry about, um, uh, for lack of a better word. Mm. Um, and rightfully so, because like, you know, they've tried to build something and they don't really care if like some action has taken, you know, 20 milliseconds versus 30 milliseconds, even though that like you know, clearly the 20 milliseconds is, you know, 30% or whatever quicker, but you really do care if like that 30 milliseconds has gone to like three or 600 milliseconds. Um, that's like broken what you can achieve. Um, so it's sort of like roughly those like two buckets of like performance cliff or, you know, cliffs, which sort of like performance bugs um, and then like raw throughput performance. But what, like when we talk about performance, we often only focus on throughput performance when this like performance cliffs performance is arguably you know you know equally as important right can i throw a can i lob a grenade up in the air for you sure go for um, it i love grenade yep okay so i know you and i have actually talked about this so i want to give you like an opportunity to like <laughs> talk about it here yep. if you open the html5 living standard um single page edition it is mm-hmm. i don't even know where i mean it's on the tens of megabytes at least yep of just basically HTML source code. Like it doesn't really contain images or anything. The CSS is remarkably simple. Um, everything is geared toward loading like as fast as you can. And uh, in Firefox, uh, you like, you know, you're done. Everything is feels done and interactive in about two seconds. But in Chrome, not so much. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, um, so why? Because Chrome has got so it's so fast. It's so full of so many of these tricks. Like why? Like this is one of those things that is sort of mind blowing to think like how could that be? You know? Yeah, there's like a fundamental trade off that like the engines have made here. We did have like a very severe bug here, which I'll get into. But for me at least, this might be different for you, um, Brian. Chrome will put push pixels to the page faster than Firefox. But like Firefox will be like completely done quicker. Yeah. And so the reason for that is that Chrome will basically go, I've consumed, you know, like X amount of bytes of HTML source. I'm going to pause there and like force a frame basically to like push something to the screen so that the user knows that like, oh, hey, I'm on, on like the HTML standard side, for example. Um, but like by doing that, um, we've made it, you know, we've created more work for ourselves later um, because when we like, you know, add more, you know, HTML, um, we've got to then, you know, trigger a recalc style, recalc layout, you know, repaint everything. And so we've got like more work to do later, if that makes sense. So we may have pushed pixels to the screen faster, but we've got, you know, in we've increased our work further down the line. Um, whereas Firefox, I believe, um, will basically wait until it's received like the whole thing and then go, right, I'm just going to do this in one, one lump. Um, and so, you know, the trade-off there is that uh, Firefox, you know, may not push uh, pixels to the screen as quickly, um, but they have, you know, it feels more interactive quicker, um, if that makes sense. So there's a, a trade-off there. We did have a really, really severe bug um, in Chrome where the HTML parser would like yield um, like constantly. Um, so I think, you know, through the whole like HTML spec, it would yield like a hundred times. Um, and so rendering the HTML spec um, in Chrome would take like 20 seconds um, to be completely done. Whereas like, you know, and Firefox would be like on the order of four or five seconds. Um, and yeah, that was, that was a bad performance, you know, bug on our behalf. Um, we've since fixed that. And I think we yield like when we like, you know, two or three, maybe four times now. Um, and so I think we're in the realm of like, depend, again, depends on your class of hardware, rah, 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 rah. But I think, you know, we're roughly within, you know, 10, 20% now. So it's it's complicated, there's trade-offs. Yeah, what, what you said that the HTML parser kept yielding. What exactly does it mean to have the parser yield and what is it yielding to? Yeah, so it, it's yielding to the like rendering engine. So, you know, the, you know, pretend that, like you're receiving bytes of the HTML page um, from the network and you know, we've only received like 20% and the network just, you know, this is concept you know, uh, conceptually how it works. You know, just pretend for a moment that like the network hasn't delivered any more bytes. Mm. We don't want to like wait for that network connection to like, you know, finish giving us, you know, the rest of the bytes because that could take, you know, seconds, ages. Um, so instead, what we'll do is we'll go, you know, okay, we've got we've got something, we've got some content. Let's like yield, you know, give it to the rendering engine to actually like try and render this page. Um, and so, you know, it'll be an incomplete HTML, um, but like we can go, hey, we've built up some DOM, we've built, you know, we can recalc style, we can perform layout, we can paint this, and then later on, you know, there might be more content added in. So it's actually, you know, like you know, this isn't happening at the network level for us. This is like in our HTML pass, we'll go, hey, we've got like enough content that we can like, you know, give this over to the rent. We think we've got enough like useful content that it's better for the user to like push some pixels earlier. But there are some sites that will like do this, that like, you know, they'll just send like the first you know, kilobyte of HTML source immediately. And then, you know, some additional posts will come in and then they'll like flush that you know, over the network connection later. Um, so there's like a trick that, you know, some sites can do, for example. Mm. So like, yeah, all of these like little decisions, uh, you know, like how often do you yield, you know, what's your policy, like matter a lot for the extremes. Mm. 
and like the HTML spec is an extreme. You know, it's probably yeah. you know like you know it's uh, you know I've talked to you you know with, you know with Brian about this is like you know the HTML spec is you know an extreme case, um, but because of that, like it's good for measuring some things, but not good for measuring you know other things. You know, it's not a representative page. It is an extreme case where you know we do like there is that we did have this performance cliff where our you know renderer was yielding to the rendering engine like you know way too often, and so it would be a lot slower. Uh, but yeah, it's it, it's complicated. <laughs> um, one of the things that that I've heard a lot about in CSS working group discussions is, or at least in the past, maybe this is no longer the case, mm -hmm. um, but in the past. There was an overwhelming fear of multi-pass layout mm -hmm. and that, you know, Flexbox and Grid discussions, like early discussions around those, it seemed like, like every third point of discussion was about whether, you know, how many passes it would require to do a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think most of us can intuitively grasp, oh, if you have to go through something more than once to figure out how to lay it out, of course, that means it will take longer to lay out. But how, I mean, how bad is that these days? Have have the improved um, improved engine speeds sort of made that less of a concern or is it still just as much of a concern as it, as it was back then? Um, it's still, it is still of concern. It's less of a concern for us now so the problem with multi-pass layouts so to back up a bit like so for example flexbox or if you've got like a row of flex items you need to do one layout initially to work out how tall everything is going to be and then you do a second layout which basically stretches all of those items to be the you know the size of the largest item so they all you know look the same size but they're all you know none of them are chopped off content Oh, um, so like you go through everything to just figure out what's the, what is the sort of minimum height and width. And then yep. once you've done that for everything in the row, then you go back through and say, okay, well, the tallest one is this many pixels tall. So we get to stretch all the other heights to be, to match that. Yep. Yep. Exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. Cool. Yep. Um, and so pretty much every layout mode has a multi-pass component of it. It's just, if you can hit it that often. So Block layout has one that's like a really, really edge case that I won't get into. Tables have this. Uh, Flexbox was like the first one that was using this by default. And Grid has it in spades, um, is, is, the, is the long and the short of it. So the reason that multi-pass layouts are tricky or like were bad, you know, like five years ago, for example, is when you nest them, the time complexity goes exponential. So if you imagine, you know, you've got a flex box, and then that flex item is also a, is also a flex box, and you know, turtles all the way down. Mm -hmm. um, so you do one layout to measure that flex box, and that flex box will do a measure, 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 measure all the way down, and then you go, great, I figured I need to be this tall, for example. And then you stretch, you know, that flex box, for example, and then that inner flex box will go, oh, great. I've got like this new height constraint. I need to remeasure all of my children. And so then you need to measure that whole subtree and wash, rinse, repeat. And so this goes into exponential territory super, super quickly um, if you don't cache anything, which is the important, in the important yeah. caveat. Uh, so, you know, like you've got, say 20 elements on a page that can then take like 10 seconds to lay out easily on like a top tier desktop machine. Oh. Um, and the important thing there is that rendering engines need to cache correctly each of those two phases. So we need to cache like the result of measuring something and then the, we need to also cache the final layout of something. And that was, you know, previously, we didn't really have to worry about this as much. Um, so this was sort of like the novel thing with Flex in that we had to cache each of those two measure and layout phases separately. And so if each layout mode brings like 
some new interesting performance constraint. The trick, which is why it was like kind of fine for Flexbox, is like as long as you don't have any like children that have like percentage heights or anything like that, it's very cheap to like stretch something height wise, but it's not like a super common case now that you can do that optimization. Yeah, you know, we had this bug in grid for quite a while where you'd just nest a whole bunch of grids and the time, you know, we could spend seconds in layout very, very easily. We, and we introduced this like new cache that would like allow us to cache these individual layouts separately. We had a very, very specialized cache for Flexbox previously, um, but didn't, didn't generalize to grid. Um, and so basically we just like needed to generalize it some more. So it, like each new layout mode, like brings like new performance challenges. Um, huh. yeah, but yeah, for like when, like if we also had this bug previously for Flexbox before we moved it over to our new engine where like, if you constructed a Flexbox with percentage heights, um, nested all the way down, you could, you know, spend tens of seconds, minutes laying out a page. Um, with, you know, like 20, 30 elements type of thing. Um, uh, yeah, so wow. that's like a good example of like a performance cliff. Yeah, uh -huh. And so it's interesting because, you know, it's like, like very easy to like go to the extremes of like, you know, it's just taking seconds. But this, like, even if you've only using, say, like three or four like nested grids, for example, this can hurt your users pretty substantially. The trouble, the additional trouble here is that previously we would try and, you know, go like, oh, the, the measure pass that we've done here is like identical to the layout pass. So we don't have to do this like secondary layout, um, which would save a bunch of time. But if you don't do that second, like if you're skipping on that second layout pass when you should have done it, then that can often result in like correctness bugs. So I remember we had this Flexbox regression chain that went on for like 10 or 12 Chrome releases where we would like fix oh. some like correctness issue. Um, and then that will cause like a performance problem in some site that had a particular structure because we were doing two layouts and it was causing exponential layout. Then we'll like fix that performance issue and then we'll cause like a correctness issue and it was you know, just like a tra trail of tears for, you know, uh, 10 or 12 releases long. So it's very, very tricky to get right um, if you're inspecting this stuff manually. Wow. Yeah, and then, I mean, you have all of those problems, which just intrinsically, right? Like mm -hmm. just trying to lay out the page Yep. is clearly difficult enough as it is. And we haven't even gotten into things like formatting lines of text, which still the complexity <laughs> of completely like boggles me every time, but you know, this isn't, it's, it's not a web purely of documents anymore, right? Like mm -hmm. there's, there's, there can be stuff watching things change from the scripted side and then that might trigger something. And so you have to maintain your performance while also allowing people to do all this crazy dynamic stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the big design considerations of like resize observer in that, you know, resize observer does allow for like a class of, you know, um, things which we didn't allow previously and like resize observer will purposely like keep stepping down in the page. What, what does that mean? So, so like, for example, if you've got, if you're observing the size of say the HTML element and the body element, um, mm. for example, um, mm -hmm. and we trigger out resize in both of them. Um, the first phase of resize observer will deliver two resize notifications. It'll go, Hey, your HTML element changed and then your body element changed. Um, and then you go, great, I'm going to do something like change the DOM, something, something, something. Um, on the next pass, even if you've changed both the HTML element and the body element, we'll only notify you of the body element changing. Um, because, mm. you know, like we have to exit out of this resize observations at some stage. And we do want you allowed to, we do want to allow you to like 
oh, something above me changed substantially. I need to like rechange my DOM completely. Um, I became smaller. I need to like remove a whole bunch of buttons because I can't you know fit them anymore. And so uh, that was sort of the design consideration there. It's like we do want to exit at some point. Like you know we can't just continually spin there forever. Like people will write infinite loops. Um, yeah. uh, but you know, we want you to allow to like respond to some other resize observer changing the DOM substantially. So yeah, like that, that was sort of the design consideration of like resize observer. Mm. Yeah. T text rendering I can get into as well. It's, uh, very counterintuitive how it works and all the design considerations there. Um, yeah, one, although one of the things I was you know, that, that, that sort of occurs here is that, you know, you, you talked about how the design of resize observer had to take all of this stuff into account, mm -hmm. right? Like, yep. like the, and the design of resize observer, you know, the, like, what, are, what is the algorithm for how it behaves and yeah. what it looks at and what it ignores, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> in yep. some cases and what it tells you. Um, but there's a whole lot of stuff Brian was mentioning this um, uh, the other day when we were talking. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that was not designed with this in mind, like old features of the web that were added in, and uh, ne you know before this was really the kind of concern that it that it was. Has, have are there examples of legacy web features that had to be rethought or? changed or or you know otherwise worked around because of these kinds of considerations especially as new layout modes get added yeah i don't think that there was like too much in layout specifically um mm -hmm. or really like any part anything fundamentally in the rendering engine um like a lot of the time mm -hmm. The sort of like original multi cache thing like was kind of for tables where like you need to cache the min content size and the max content size separately from layout. That gets really important for tables. But yeah, I don't think there was too much that was I, I yeah, I mean at least in my experience at least. I know there's like other things, you know, obviously in the web. Um I think Brian, you might have mentioned this earlier, where like, you know, document dot write um is a really really nasty api um to you know get throughput performance or like uh what was the api what was the api where it like you could pause script by like sending up an alert dialog was it just like oh, document yeah. dot alert yeah. or something like that yeah um yep. just alert yeah just alert alert prompt any of those they just stop stop, everything. stop everything yeah stop the world um yeah so like you know broadly speaking like synchronous JS APIs that do non-trivial amounts of work is like pretty bad, but like we do allow that on like workers. So like a good example of this is like the Atomics API in script will, you know, you've got like some shared array buffer. You can listen for a change on that array buffer and then get like, you know, notified when it does. I think it's like async wait or something like that. Um, but on workers, there's a synchronous version of this, and that's purposely not available on the main thread because you know someone will, you know, create some script that will be bad, you know, for user experience where it'll just block the main thread, you know, for a long period of time, um, and that's something that we you know don't want users to experience. Um, there's, that's a little bit that one's a little bit contentious um, about there because there's are people that uh will argue for you know there are use cases for synchronously blocking the main thread but it sort of comes down to what your what you know what what your priorities are xml HTTP request also had a synchronous mode if you remember oh yeah yeah i remember that yep yeah, yeah. and yeah. and there were a lot of people who argued that like we needed that mm -hmm. um and there were useful things we could do yep. um I wrote a very simple like module system yep. yeah. for JavaScript yep. using that. And it is very easy to reason about if you do it that way, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not it's not exceptionally performant, but it's very easy to to think about. The logic is very simple and everything. Yeah. Yep. 
um yeah no there's yeah every every turn like there there is a there's always something that you can do with these synchronous apis i think like uh yeah my position would be uh yes but at what you know user experience cost um someone yeah someone will always write something the web is amazing the web is like a tapestry of you know different ideas um and someone will always write you know that thing that you know you didn't expect you can say in the spec yeah. like hey don't nest grids like more than like three times so you're going to have like bad performance problems and then someone will nest it um uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. so we always have to you know design for that okay like a good recent example for us is like we had this artificial limit on like the number of rows and columns you could have in a grid um we limited it to like a thousand um and uh this is complex because you know previously we expanded all of those like rows and columns out of memory so we'll have you know a thousand slots um in some array um representing each one and like traversing over that thousand elements is slow it takes time mm. we recently now basically allow you know you in max you know like whatever that you know is um right. and to the 20th or whatever yeah exactly <laughs> and the reason that we like allowed that is because like the microsoft folks changed the representation um so instead of like spitting out you know to the whatever in memory we'll store them as compressed repeaters so we'll say like hey there's like a thousand tracks of one pixel size and there's another like 20 which is where the grid item is of one pixels inside and then there's the remaining you know whatever million um in one pixels of size so we only have to iterate over like three things instead of you know x million because we had bug report you know we limited it to a thousand um and then we consistently had bug reports that you know hey like i can't you know i need like 100,000 and we're like <laughs> sorry um jeez uh and i think now uh that... but it's pretty easy to say that seems unreasonable right like that seems really unreasonable and then and then people show you and you go boy i, I yep. mean dang now it's reasonable maybe, <laughs> yep, yep. maybe it maybe it's not as unreasonable as i think it is yeah you know? yeah exactly um so i think now like you know firefox has the lowest limit of all of the browsers um and so now they have bug reports of like hey this is like not enough chrome supports larger um so we're always you know uh there's always you know that like frustration developers they'll run up to some limit and complain to the lowest limit that it's you know the lowest yeah so yeah we'll get that slowly and and then in all of that to come back to a, to a point that i sort of diverted us away from you got to render text yeah so yeah text text is amazing text is pretty counterintuitive so like a good example of this is you know say you've got the width of word foo um, for example, and then you've got some width of, you know, the width of bar. What would be the width then of foo bar? Would it be smaller, the same size, or larger? Let me ask a question just to clarify that mentally, yeah. because yep. yep. So when you say the result of foo uh, and bar, you, you're talking about like we're rendering them sort of smashed together with no spaces or anything. Or just... Yeah. So so we can get into spaces later but yeah so let's say like just with like no spaces for example just okay so they just flow into one yeah, another. they just flow into one yeah. another In, intuitively you're just like oh like width of foo bar is going to equal the width of foo plus the width of bar we're done but the answer is it can be smaller it can be larger it can be the same size we don't know we have to invoke text shaping to actually know um what the final size is going to be how could that be smaller yeah so you might have some kerning that will mean that r and b um overlap slightly hmm. letter spacing minus one px yep hmm. um so you might have you know some like some kerning in the font table or something like that the other thing that might happen is you might have something in your like uh g sub you know your ligature table so then the font that you're using might have something special where it will have like, oh, my, the R and the B have like some special glyph that I want it to render as. And that has, 
you know, that could be like wider or, you know, smaller than like the R and B smushed, they've smushed together separately, um, if that makes sense. You, yeah, so it gets very complex, very, and this is like just with like Latin type fonts. There's a whole separate conversation about like more complex t- fonts, like, um, you know, like Arabic, um, yeah. Thai is like super, super complex. There was a really good talk done by a native, someone, you know, who understands the Arabic script on just like, you know, the basics of how complex just even like basic words can get. And you know, you'll add some character to your string and then the whole word will change effectively. So, you know, it's, it's very, you know, like text is very, very tricky basically. Mm. And then you get into spaces and you think we also have mathematical text, I suppose. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's tricky. Again, there's like all sorts of like, you know, offsets that you want to do to like get things to look correct to the perceived eye. So then you get into like, oh, surely, you know, like spaces are fine. So like, if I just like cache the width of the word separately, like, you know, the space is always going to be like, you know, so many pixels wide. Spaces can also be in ligature tables and spaces can also have kerning. And so it gets very complicated very quickly still. Would it be helpful to to define uh, the words that you're using? Uh, Yeah, yeah, potentially. Ligature table, I think, is not... uh... Like a thing, a thing that, that yeah. most, yeah. So, so a good example of this is when you type, you know, F I, um, into your, you know, into your favorite, you know, editor, browser, whatever, um, in a lot of fonts, F I, um, will get replaced with, um, like an, a different, a different like glyph. So a different rendering of the actual, of the actual characters. And they'll get rendered as one unit together. Um, they'll sort of be like smush, where like the I, you know, will like sort of fit very, very closely underneath the F, and like the I dot will disappear and stuff like that. So when we when I say like glyph, I mean like something that the text you know that the the text engine has outputted that may rep- represent multiple characters. Um, the FI ligature is you know the common one that you'll see in Latin text. But there's a whole bunch of, you know, depending on the font, there could be a whole bunch of them. Mm. So when, when I say like, you know, ligature table or substitution table, it's like going, hey, I've got like the F and the I like characters. Instead of rendering it as the F glyph and then the I glyph, I need to look at the F I glyph instead. Right. And like, this is one of like the many, like fonts as a whole, like subspecialty that you can spend an absolute lifetime on. Yeah. Uh, we're fortunate. We're super fortunate that, like, you know, we use like um, Half Buzz and Behead, who maintains that. You know, that it's an exceptionally good library. Yeah. So, like, there's all these like subtleties in text. The naive way that you'd like build up a something that produces text is you'd go, okay, like, I've got some width available to me. You know, say like 100 pixels. Um, I'm going to keep on adding words um, to the line until I hit the 200 pixels limit or something like that. But you might have, you know, things like spaces that could be substituted into one glyph. You might have like complex kerning, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and so sort of the only way to do it safely is the process of like converting characters and fonts into you know, the final width, like what glyphs you use is called shaping. There's other, other steps before that, but let's just call it shaping for the moment. And the safest way that you can do that is you give the shaping engine the whole content um, every single time you want to measure it because you just don't know what the what the font may request. So there's optimizations wow. that you need to do. Um, if you do it that way, um, you can do it that way. It, it, it can work. Um, there's a whole bunch of like checking that you need to do to make sure that you're not breaking any of these invariants. Blink sort of does it in a kind of interesting way in that we will work backwards, which is a little bit counterintuitive. So we will lay out the whole paragraph of text. You know, we'll give the whole paragraph to the text shaper as one single line. And we'll go, just measure this whole thing. It's probably not going to fit, but we don't care. And then we'll go, great, you know, you're 5,000 pixels wide or whatever. And then we'll search for 
uh, what's called a break opportunity. So like a place where we can break the text onto a next line and then go, okay, we'll pretend that we'll break here. Then we give that subsect, you know, the subsection from like the start to that breakpoint to the shaping engine. And then the current and true thing is that then with that breakpoint, the text might increase in size again, like it still might not fit. And so we continually walk backwards until we find something that will fit or we're at the first break opportunity. Um, so yeah, that's the little, that's the, a very, very simplified version of text layout is counterintuitive and probably doesn't work how you would expect. Cause it gets complicated with like languages, for example, like Thai. Thai does have spaces, but they don't separate what we think of as words. They separate phrases instead, for example. So, you know, and like very, you know, simple text rendering engine, which is just like split everything on spaces wouldn't render tie correctly, um, for example, because it would be, you know, separating, you know, sub sentences instead of actual words. Then you've got like the CJK class of scripts where, you know, obviously like each, you know, word quote unquote is, you know, one single glyph. Yeah. Text is, text is super complicated. You can spend a lifetime uh, on this sort of stuff, but I've got, I should prefix with, you know, postfix all of this with, I've got a very, very high level understanding of how fonts, uh, and text rendering works. Um, there are definitely probably better experts that you can get on the show, um, to sort of talk about how it all works. But yeah, it's, it's very, very complex to get these, we call them complex scripts cause they're complex. Um, you know, complex scripts like Arabic Thai to have fast throughput. And so like equivalent throughput to say like Latin text, which is sort of what we sort of what we index on a lot of the time as you know, a lot of us are, you know, Latin, come from Latin backgrounds. I should write a blog post at some point on just like, you know, the 10 false, you know, falsehoods that programmers believe about like text rendering at some point and go into all of this into detail. But uh, yeah, that'll, that'll be, that'll be pretty fun. Someone else should write that. It'd be much easier. I don't have to. Uh, there's a, there's a thing that is uh, in our show notes that I thought was interesting. Uh, one of the things that's nice about the web is that it really changed our design thinking, right? Like we're used to designing for really fixed things. Mm -hmm. And then the web came along and it said, no, I mean, the nature of the web is fluid. You have to kind of break the, the fluid nature. And I mean, it took a long time until we got like responsive design and, and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. There's two aspects of that that are, that are kind of interesting. I don't know if you can speak to them or not, but the one is when we introduced media queries mm -hmm. um, and that like, is interesting because it introduced a, a thing where you like at some point in time, you sort of shove a whole new style sheet or pull it out mm -hmm. like into the calculation. And I expect that that means that like you have sort of no choice, but to recompute the world. Uh, but the other one is that one of the things that makes this all really possible is the ability to introduce like, well, I, it, you scroll if you don't have enough room. Like this is how much room you get, and then you you just scroll. Mm -hmm. um, and you had put, I think it was you that added a note about auto scroll. Oh yeah. So I like the opportunity <laughs> to, to speak about that. Yeah, o o auto auto scroll bars are the bane of like most loud engineers' existence. Um, they're like awful. Um, and we do some very very dirty hacks to basically get them to be fast and stable. The, so like the long story short is that when you lay out a box, um, you don't know if you need a scroll bar or not. Um, and so the thing that we typically do is that we'll assume that there's no scroll bar that exists. So we'll lay out our content and we'll go, great, we've laid out our content um, and oh no, it overflows. So we need to add a scroll bar. And so now, because we've added a scroll bar, we need to go back to the start of layout and start everything again, because the width of everything will have changed by default. And then we go through, and there is a possibility that then you decide, oh no, we like need the other scroll bar. So we need the scroll bar at the bottom, for example. And then you need to start layout again. And then there's sub problems, like you can get into a state where you'll add that like right scroll bar, for example, 
And then that second layout pass, you don't need it anymore. Um, so what do you do? Because you're in this state where you both need a score bar and then you don't need it, which is very, very counterintuitive. And so this is like a quintessential like multi-pass layout that I don't think any engine like caches particularly well. Having auto score bars and everything is super popular in enterprise type use cases. And it's, yeah, very, 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 you know, can trigger very, very poor performance. The way that you can sort of like mitigate this is, you know, we've added, the CSS spoken group has added a few properties like scroll bar stable, which sort of like will reserve space for scroll bars on each side is like this extra like padding. Uh, I should also say that like the auto scroll bar problem, you know, only exists when you've got your like OS system settings to like always show the scroll bars. So this broadly, you know, this isn't a problem for like overlay scroll bars, which is more and more of the default these days on OSs. Um, so we don't have this like problem on like Android and you know by default on like Chrome OS or Mac OS, for example. And I think on de by default on like Windows 11. Um, I suspect because you know the the OSs also, you know, hate auto scroll bars for this reason. Um, but yeah, the auto, auto scroll bars can get into super complexity uh, really, really quickly. Uh, and it's very, very tricky to get correct and performant. The other thing that can happen is that this gets into a little bit of an advanced topic, but like the intrinsic size can change because scroll bar is kind of like border or padding. So it can like widen your box. It's a whole separate conversation of like, how should that work? Um, and it gets complicated very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Performance is an optimization problem, right? So like, mm -hmm. it, like you can write something that's technically correct and we'll get the job done, but it might take way too long. Mm -hmm. And I think like one of the things that's interesting to think about here is that we're designing, you know, a, a standard that's being implemented in multiple different engines, which have like their own architecture and baggage and past and future plans mm -hmm. and like you know i have heard this i've been in discussions before where like an idea gets posited like what if we did this like in the standard and like different engines can have different opinions because it's not the same ask of all engines right like that's it's right a, it's a different ask. yeah yeah i mean that that's sort of why like you know so Link, we had this project called Loud NG, which basically, you know, re-architectured our Loud Engine because we were effectively running into all of the same problems. So we had, you know, the, the long and the short of it is that we had, you know, performance, these like exponential blowout costs with like Flexbox and Grid that were really, really tricky to get a handle on, you know, evidenced by that, you know, 10 to 12 regression chain in Flexbox that we had. It was really, really difficult to add new features as well. And then, you know, some of the asks that we saw was just like, uh, oh boy, you know, that's going to take like years worth of work to get a, you know, to a quality solution. We could do a short term thing that's like kind of buggy, that's like, you know, 70% of the way there. But um, we were really, really constrained by, uh, like our fundamental architecture at that point in time. You know, people people can relate to like it being much more difficult to add a certain concept into one code base than another. Mm -hmm. And like just thinking about the, the standards versus the engines and why, like why sometimes we don't do things or why they take longer uh, yeah. because we have to do like re-architecture because we're like, boy, there's so many good ideas here but we didn't, we're not prepared for this, you know, yeah. uh, we can't consider it right now, Yeah. but we, boy, we sure would like to. Um, yeah. And we're also constrained by our past for features that were sort of bolted on that didn't necessarily like have the right underlying architecture. Mm -hmm. So like a really good example of this for us was vertical writing modes was like effectively bolted on to the loud engine that we had um, relatively quickly and didn't think about all of the nuances that's involved with vertical writing modes. I can get into that, but it's complicated. Um, 
And so with our re-architecture, we're like, right, writing modes is going to be like a first class, you know, like citizen. We're not going to do any of the sort of like hacks that we had to do previously to like get it to work. And so for us now, like vertical writing modes is, you know, like trivial. You know, it, like each engine has like a different past. And, you know, when you bolt, you know, we found at least that like, you know, when you like try and quickly bolt something on onto it versus like doing like a partial re-architecture to like rethink something, you might get there like, you know, quicker, but it might be a lot more buggy than what you'd likely, you know, desire. And then you might have to, you know, do a whole bunch of fixes later or like a continued fixes to get it up to, you know, the standard that what developers expect. So yeah, each, each engine has their own constraints, their own resources, own history and, you know, technical debt past that, you know, one engine might go, hey, you know, this feature is like trivial to implement. We can do it in like, you know, six months. And then another engine might be sitting there just going, oh boy, that's like, you know, a two to three year project for us. Um, mm. So, you know, for us personally, like, you know, we were fortunate in that, like, we had the right team. We had, you know, the right amount of time um, that we could sort of invest in this. Um, uh, it was a, you know, a hell of a lot of work, um, uh, but, you know, we sort of got the performance and the correctness gains that we expected out of it. One really nice thing that we saw consistently is that when we switched like each layout mode to the new, you know, the new architecture, you know, effectively the bugs in that area basically dropped by half. Um, so if you think about that, you know, instead of, you know, an engineer spending say like three to five days on a bug um, multiplied by like, you know, 200 bugs. That's like over a year's worth of work. Uh, you know, we found it almost like cheaper uh, counterintuitively to like, you know, re-architect the whole thing. And then you know, we just found that like we closed all of these bugs. Lots and lots of difficulties. Yep. So many difficulties. I, yeah. I've got a, I've got so many gray hairs from <laughs> <laughs> all the different stuff we've run into uh, previously. Because you're like only as fast as your, your weakest link. Um, like, do you ever run into like some change either up, you know, upstream from you or downstream from you, not in the open source sense, but in the, in the pipeline sense mm -hmm. is like too slow or too greedy. And that like, as it improves, you know, like now you're the problem. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, but not as much as you'd expect. Um, it's sort of yeah. interesting because like, you know, occasionally like developers are pretty, you know, there are, there, there are developers that are pretty aware of what the slow parts of your engine are. And so the bug reports that we get from these web developers are really, really high quality. They're, they're fantastic. Like they'll go, Hey, like I've got these like thousand elements and with this style, like, you know, it's super slow, but if I change it to this, it's like gone away. I've worked around it, but you know, you should probably fix this at some point. And we're like, yep, we should probably fix that. That's kind of bad. Um, but like, yeah. you know, we, we find that like web developers will, you know, will discover these like performance cliffs. Um, and this is why, like, you know, personally, I, I like, you know, spending a lot of time, you know, thinking about performance cliffs versus like raw throughput, because, you know, this is what developers often run into. Um, they, that they will like edge, like they will come up with like some mitigation to like, you know, work around your bug effectively. Um, there, there are times where like another part of the engine is like causing some problems for you. Um, so like, you know, the, the classical example here is that like HTML spec thing where the HTML parser was just yielding way too often. And, you know, this came up as like a layout bug because the vast majority of time, like what you're just spending in layout and, you know, people were asking, Hey, you know, we're spending far more time in layout versus in blink versus like Firefox. Like why is our layout engine slow? Um, and then we dug into it and we're just like, well, it's not that the layout engine is slow. It's the fact that like we're running layout 1000, you know, a hundred times versus like once. Um, and so there are like, 
you know, some characteristic of the pipeline upstream from you like can affect what the perceived problem is, but it might be some fundamentally different problem if that's a different right. way of thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sim but like, you know, similarly, like, you know, there might be like some new, you know, new feature that people are using, you know, say like, you know, grid, for example, good example, um, where we're like, great, you know, we've, we've worked, you know, uh, and you know, Agalia did the first work uh, on Grid in this area for Blink. Quite, you know, sold implementation. You know, people were using it, uh, but then you know, Stites started to use Grid more and more and more, and then ran into like these performance type of issues of just like, hey, we're constrained by the number of tracks that we need, or like constrained by how many Grid levels that we're nesting. We had fun one fun bug report where like we fixed some performance issue and then like suddenly someone's typing was taking 200 milliseconds each time they did a keystroke. Um, so yeah, it's a complex, complex space. The ecosystem will often change and like start pressing on what you've thought that you could get away with performance wise. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. This is why, again, why I've got gray hairs. <laughs> you know, web rendering engines are used in sort of all sorts of use cases. Um, you know, from like enterprise to like consumer space to like, you know, generating PDFs on the server side, um, all sorts of stuff. And yeah, we lots get of embedded stuff now lots too. of embedded stuff as well. Yep. Um, and it's always a complicated task of, you know, uh, trying to prioritize, you know, performance and bug fixing work um, for all of those different constituents. Yeah. Cool. Or not cool, but cool. <laughs> scary. On on that on that samba on that note, um, yeah, we yeah. This is I mean this is why I enjoy working on the web. Just on you know personal note is that uh, you know web rendering engines bring so much value to society at large. Um, just you know the web generally. Um, but if you want to, you know, scope it down a little bit to like rendering engines, you know, like so much value to, you know, so much economic value, even if you want to put like a number to it that, you know, effectively we give away for free. And yeah, that, that's what keeps me in this game. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation, Ian. And, you know, as we said before, we could <laughs> probably go on for hours and we, hours. We, we but, could, but um, we should probably, yeah, limit, limit it at some point. Limit it at some point. Maybe, maybe come back for a part two. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, I'm more than happy to chat about, like, all, you know, all sorts of, you know, layout things and, yeah, all sorts of things more generally. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure, um, yeah, as always. Yeah, thanks for being here. Hopefully this was interesting to uh, listeners as well. I, I don't think there will be any concerns on that front. <laughs> so thanks again, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. See you later, Eric and Brian. Thanks.